Welcome. Welcome to Heavenly News tonight. And boy, have we, have we got a good lesson tonight. We have got a good lesson tonight. I would like to welcome all of those of you who are joining me at this moment live on Facebook. I appreciate you being here with me every night. And tonight, if you saw the time, if you saw the title in the post that went out earlier today, you saw that we are going to be studying Jacob's dream at Bethel. Jacob's dream at Bethel. And we we're all familiar with this passage of scripture. I remember um, growing up. I remember in Sunday school. This was read to me by my Sunday school teachers many times about Jacob's ladder when he had that dream and he saw the ladder and angels ascending and descending upon it. So that's where we're going to hit tonight. Jacob's dream at Bethel. And you know, you know something occurred to me. Um, if God can pull my life out of a pit, he can pull anybody's life out of a pit. You could take that to the spiritual bank. If God can pull my life out of the pit I was sinking in, He can pull anyone's life out of a pit. God is a merciful God who chases us down, and we will see that tonight. He is worthy of our praise. He is worthy of our praise. God has a lot of grace. God has a lot of grace. A lot of grace. Listen, don't you dare quit. Don't you dare quit. God finishes what He starts. That is His character. God finishes what He starts. That is His character. And the first scripture that I want to land on is Genesis 27 and 41. But I want to bring you, I need to bring you up to speed. At this moment, Jacob has stolen the birthright from Esau, the firstborn, firstborn son. He has also stolen the blessing, Esau's blessing that he was to receive as the firstborn son. He deceived his father Isaac. And to get you up to speed, here we go. In Genesis 27 and 41, it says, Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him. And Esau determined in his heart the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. And we know, we, we know that um, what harboring and consoling and um, nurturing anger and bitterness inside of us does to us. We, 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 we console it. We hold on to it. We hang on to it. We hang on to it when we should let it go into the hands of God. So Esau was just, that bitterness was just balling up in him. All of that anger and, and from everything that Jacob had done to him. From everything that Jacob had done to him. And I'm going to drop down to verse 46 now. It says, So Rebekah said to Isaac, I'm sick of my life because of these Hittite women. If Jacob marries a Hittite woman like one of them, what good is my life? Have you ever heard anything like this? Rebecca, Jacob's mother, she says, she, says, she says to Isaac, she says, I'm sick of my life because of these Hittite women. If Jacob marries a Hittite woman like one of them, I'm going to die if he marries a Hittite woman. I'm going to die. Have you ever seen such a manipulative woman? I mean, she is scheming and conniving constantly. And anything we have to manipulate to get, we rarely get to keep. Anything we have to manipulate to get, we rarely get to keep. We rarely get to keep. Genesis, Genesis 27, 42 says, When the words of her oldest son Esau were reported to Rebekah, she summoned her youngest son Jacob and said to him, Listen, your brother Esau is consoling himself by planning to kill you. And then drop down to uh, 
So then she, she sent him. She sent him away. She sent him. She said, so now she told him, she said, listen to me, Jacob, my son. Go, flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran and stay with him for a few days until your brother's anger subsides, until your brother's rage turns away from you and he forgets what you have done to him. So she was, she was plotting and what a scheming, scheming. She's, she was just scheming, manipulative, manipulative. This is a family where deception is the way the game is played. This is a family where deception is the way the game is played and everyone is playing the game. Everyone is playing the game. Everyone. And in chapter 28, it says in verse 1, Isaac summoned Jacob, blessed him, and commanded him, Don't take a wife from the Canaanite women. Go at once to Paddan Aram, to the house of Bethuel, your mother's father. Marry one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply you, so that you become an assembly of peoples. May God give you and your offspring the blessing of Abraham so that you may possess the land where you live as a foreigner, the land God gave to Abraham. So Isaac, verse 5, So Isaac sent Jacob to Paddan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Esau noticed that Isaac blessed Jacob and sent him to Paddan Aram to get a wife there. Now Esau noticed that. He saw that. When he blessed him, Isaac commanded Jacob, Do not marry a Canaanite woman. And Jacob listened to his father and mother and went to Paddan Aram. Esau realized that his father Isaac disapproved of the Canaanite women. So Esau went to Ishmael and married, in addition to all his other wives, Mahalahath, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. She was the sister of Nehoboth. I want you to see that word. There's a word in there. You'll find it in verse 3. Verse 3, it says, May God Almighty bless you. That word, God Almighty. In the Hebrew, that is the word El Shaddai. El Shaddai. God is El, E-L in Hebrew. Uh, Shaddai, all for Almighty. God Almighty, El Shaddai. It is a masculine noun and a name for God, meaning Shaddai Almighty. This is a name for the Lord, the Old Testament people of faith referring to, to him as El Shaddai, God Almighty, El Shaddai. Verse 10 of, of chapter 28 says that Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from the place put it there at his head and lay down in that place and he dreamed. A stairway was set on the ground with its top reaching heaven and God's angels were going up and down on it, up and down on it. Yahweh was standing there beside him saying, I am Yahweh, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your offspring the land that you are now sleeping on. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out toward the west, the east, the north, and the south. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Look, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Verse 16, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that was near his head and set it up as a marker. He poured oil on top of it and named the place Bethel. Though previously the city was named Luz. Then Jacob made a vow. If God will be with me and watch over me on this journey. If he prov provides me with food to eat and clothing to wear. And if I return safely to my father's house. 
then the Lord will be my God. This stone that I have set up as a marker will be God's house, and I will give to you a tenth of all that you give me. Hallelujah. 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 Hello, Virginia. Good to see you. Hallelujah. I want to read uh, verse 11 again. It says, Jacob reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from the place, put it there at his head, and lay down in that place. In verse 11, if we could see the word for place, makoim in the Hebrew, makoim in the Hebrew, if we could see the word for place written in the original Hebrew language, it is re-emphasized. It is used three times in that one verse, over and over, three times in the Hebrew. Place, place, place. The NIV translation, reached, could be translated more closely with the words, happen upon or strikes upon that place. He happened upon or strikes upon that place. It emphasizes the randomness with which Jacob chose this place to pass at night. Hello, Stacy. Good to see you, Dee. So what I, what I want to do is we're going to start drawing some points from this, this passage of Scripture that we've read. And the first point, and we, we really need to get this, this first, this first point... A place we think we've randomly happened upon can be a divinely scheduled venue for an awesome encounter with God. Let me say that again. A place we think we've randomly happened upon can be a divinely scheduled venue for an awesome encounter with God. If we are believers, listen to me, you need to, you need to hear this. If we are believers in Jesus Christ, nothing happening in our lives is random. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Jacob set out to find a wife and he ran into God instead. How amazing is that? How amazing is that? He set out to find a wife and he ran into God instead. Right there in that spot. Right there in that spot. We have got to add a life-changing encounter with God because, because we are always on the lookout for some earthly relationship that is going to cut it for us. And it's not. We cannot, we, 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 listen, we cannot think that we are going to replace that God space inside of us with a human being. There is a void inside of us that only God can fill. The scriptures tells us that. He has set eternity in our hearts. Only God can fill that void. No human being can fill it. It will never work. It will never work. Never work. And we keep making the same mistakes in relationships over and over and over and over again. The same mistakes. Listen to me very carefully. If we do not get our hearts satisfied in Jesus first, we have engaged in a relationship that an, that an unhealthy heart chose. If we do not get our hearts satisfied in Jesus first, we have engaged in a relationship that an unhealthy heart chose. It will be, it will be painful at the least and destructive at the worst. I know what I'm talking about. I've been there a few times. It will be painful at the least and destructive at the worst. Listen to me. Let God deal with your stuff before you end up in a marriage. Let God deal with your stuff before you end up in a marriage. Philippians 1.9, Paul says, and I pray this, that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and every kind of discernment. Every kind of discernment. Keep growing in knowledge. Every kind of discernment. Let God deal with your stuff. 
before you end up in a marriage or even in a close friendship. Let God deal with your stuff. The second point we can draw from this is that God's first stated purpose for the encounter was to tell Jacob that the God of Abraham and Isaac was to be his God as well. God's first stated purpose for the encounter was to tell Jacob that the God of Abraham and Isaac was to be his God as well. Listen to what he says in Genesis 28, 13. Listen to what he says in Genesis 28, 13. It says, Yahweh was standing there beside him saying, I am Yahweh, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your offspring the land that you are now sleeping on. That's what he said. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is our same God. He still takes us out of the mouths of lions. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He still takes us out of the mouths of lions. Just like he took Daniel out of the mouth of, mouth of the lion. Lion's den. And Paul also makes a reference to this in the New Testament, that he was saved from the mouth of the lion. You know, I, I, I just marvel at the mystery that God chases us down. He pursues us. I, it's just, it's, it's just such a mystery, a marvel. He chases us down. God knows us better than ourselves, that's for sure. He knows us better than ourselves. And in Genesis 28 and 12, it says that Jacob dreamed. A stairway was set on the ground with its top reaching heaven, and God's angels were going up and down on it, up and down on it. In Genesis 11, 4, when, they, when they, uh, the, the peoples were, were of one language and one speech, and they began to, they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the sky. Let us make a name for ourselves, otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the old earth. Let me tell you something. What man could never do, God has done. What man could never do, God has done. Hallelujah. He is the connector of earth and heaven. He is the only one. The only one. He is the connector of earth and heaven. The only one. The only one. I love these scriptures in John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 47 to 51. It says, Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, Here is a true Israelite. No deceit is in him. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, Nathanael replied, You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus responded to him, Do you believe only because I told you? I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than this. Then he said, I assure you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Wow. And that fits right in here with our passage of Scripture. You know what I believe Jesus was saying to them? to, to um, Nathaniel. I believe Jesus was saying to Nathaniel, you need to understand this. I am Jacob's ladder. I am Jacob's, I am Jacob's ladder. You're looking at Jacob's ladder. You are looking at Jacob's ladder. He is the connection, the access, the only one. Now point three, I, I'd like to look at some representations in Jacob's dream. Some rep, rep, representations in Jacob's dream.
And the first one is the latter's obvious purposes of connection and access. The latter's obvious purposes of connection and access. Its top reaches to heaven, but the stairway is resting on earth. This connection, listen to me, this connection that will exist between heaven and earth, this stairway was not dropped out of heaven down. It is something that had to be on earth and go up. It is the incarnation ear because Christ Jesus had to come down to earth as the God-man. Oh, hear me, hear me. Christ Jesus had to come down to earth as the God-man. The cross had to rest in the earth. The cross said to rest in the earth, in the guilty sod, and then it reaches up. And Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. Oh, praise his name. Praise his name. The connection was made between earth and heaven. This was the ultimate connection, the ultimate access. The ultimate connection, the ultimate access. Everything about this scene could suggest Christ to us over and over again, over and over again. After the dream, Jacob described the place as the gate of heaven in Genesis 28 and 17. In other words, whatever this is, it is the way in. It's the way in. In John 10, 9, Christ says, I am the gate. I am the gate. And you better believe he is. He is the gate. God chose his ambassador, his ambassador. God chose his ambassador in this particular vision to be Jacob. Jacob would be the one God would rename Israel. He would be the one God would rename Israel. The next bullet point is. The dream coming specifically to Jacob, who would soon be renamed Israel. And in Psalm, Psalm 105, verses 8 to 10 reads, it says, He remembers, that's God, He remembers His covenant forever. The promise He ordained for a thousand generations. The covenant He made with Abraham, swore to Isaac, and confirmed to Jacob as a decree, and to Israel as an everlasting covenant. He confirmed that to Israel as an everlasting covenant. As an everlasting covenant. Wow. Wow. Genesis 28:11 says that he reached a certain place, a certain place, he reached a certain place, and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from the place, put it there at his head, and lay down in that place. Jacob is representing Israel, the twelve tribes to us. That's what he's representing. The rock is Jesus Christ. He said, upon this rock I will build my church. Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock I will build my church. And Peter said of Christ, in 1 Peter 2 and 6, Peter says, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And Peter would have well remembered that Christ also promised to build his church upon a rock. Peter would have well remembered that. The emphasis of Genesis 28, 14 is clearly upon descendants. It's clearly upon descendants. We have the rock, and Jacob's head is resting on the rock. He is representing Israel to us. Now, humanity is responsible for the death of Christ. The church was birthed out of Jewish people. We have resting upon the stone where Christ is going to build his church, Jewish people for generations to come. 
generations to come. Point four. Well, let me read Genesis 28 and verses 13 and 14. Let me read those again. Genesis 28, 13 and 14 and 16. Genesis 28, 13 says, Yahweh was standing there beside him saying, I am Yahweh, the God of your father, Abraham and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your offspring the land that you are now sleeping on. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out toward the west, the east, the north and the south. All the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Verse 16, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. Surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. Point four, Jacob's reaction could compel us to ask God to increase our awareness of his glorious presence. Jacob's reaction could compel us to ask God to increase our awareness of his glorious presence. We don't want to miss the visitation. If I am in the presence of God, I want to know it. I want to know it, and I know it now. I can feel his presence all around me. If you're in the presence of God, you want to know it. You want to feel his presence. We are as filled with the Spirit as we are yielded to the Holy Spirit. We have to yield our lives to the Holy Spirit. We have to let go and let the Holy Spirit take control of us, our entire being. We are as filled with the Spirit as we are yielded to the Holy Spirit. If we would live Spirit-filled lives, we would know when He is around. Oh, did you get that? I hope you got that. If we would live spirit-filled lives, we would know when he, he is around. We would know it. When His presence is around us, we are aware of it. We are aware of it. The thickness of His activity is right over our heads. We could feel it. We're aware of it. We could feel it all around us. It was the God show for Jacob. And not only the God show, but the Jesus show as well. Genesis 28, 17 to 19. It says, Jacob says, it says Jacob was afraid and said, what an awesome place this is. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that was near his head and he set it up as a marker. He poured oil on the top of it and named the place Bethel, though, previous, though previously the city was named Luz. Then Jacob made a vow. If God will be with me and watch over me on this journey, if he provides me with food to eat and clothing to wear, and if I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. This stone that I have set up as a marker will be God's house and I will give to you a tenth of all that you give me. Wow. Jacob set up the stone as a pillar. Point five. Jacob set up the stone as a pillar. He realized that this place is none other than the house of God. This is the house of God. Bethel. And Jacob then makes it a standing stone and he pours the drink offering on top of it. This is an incredibly profound moment because he has named this place the house of God. This is the house of God. And he realizes that. And during the days of the patriarchs and Moses, this practice was acceptable. He realized, he realized God was in the place. 
It became unacceptable later when God's people treated memorials as idols rather than symbols. And we can take the places, our experiences where we have met with God, and we can make an idol out of it. We can. But we don't want to do that. God said, I will have no other gods before me. No, no. No idols of stone and wood. Things that cannot speak, cannot listen. I am the one and only true God. There is no other God besides me. None. I am Yahweh, the self-existent and eternal God. I have no beginning and no ending. I am the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega. Woo! Hallelujah. Man. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Jacob set this up as a memorial of his encounter with the one and only El Shaddai. The Holy One. The God of his fathers. When we worship anything that God does, any encounter we have had with God, more than God himself, it becomes so misused and an idol in our lives. It does. It does. If we worship something that God has done in our lives, so worship any encounter, we have had in our lives more than we worship God, it becomes misused and an idol in our lives. And that is so prevalent today. You can see it all around in the churches. You can see it all around in the churches. Due to such misuse, the prophet Osea renamed Bethel, meaning house of God. He renamed it beth Aven, meaning house of nothingness. House of nothingness. I can tell you this. In the coming months, in this country, you are going to see some pastors quote, I'm putting in quotes now, quotes, pastors, preachers, and men of God who you thought were, you are going to see them and their churches fall. You're going to see them and their churches fall. Because they had misused the things that God has done in their lives. They have misused it and made idols out of it. They have made idols out of them. They have misused the things that God has done in their lives and they have made idols out of them. Not only that, there's so much corruption going on in churches all throughout this country we call the Bahamas. It is just staggering. It's just staggering. Christian people have no respect for God no more. Some Christian people have no respect for God no more. Some pastors, preachers, and men, they don't have any respect for God anymore. If you can let idolatry come into church, if you can let sexual immorality come into church, if you can let people get out behind the pulpit who you know are involved in sexual immorality, who you know are involved in witchcraft, who you know are involved in idolatry, then, buddy, that is a dangerous thing. You are treading on dangerous ground. I am warning you. This is a warning going out tonight. You are treading on dangerous ground. And God will not tolerate it. He might tolerate it for a while. But when he brings his hand down, that is it. Your church will be renamed the house of nothingness. Nothingness. Just like Hosea renamed Bethel. 
the house of nothingness. Nothingness. Let me tell you something. something. When we move God out of it, it is nothing. When we move God out of it, it is nothing. It's nothing. It's nothing. And that is happening all through this country right now. All through this country. God help us. God help us. Jesus help us. God help us to stand our ground as Christians in the truth of the Word of God and preach the Word of God whether we get ridiculed, whether we get laughed at, whether we get scorned, whatever. That is the kind of believing Christian we should be. After all that Jesus Christ has done for us, come on, come on. We can't do enough for Him. We can't do enough for Him. And I, didn't, I did not intend to bring this into the mix tonight. I ask God to put the words in my mouth to speak. And He surely, he surely is doing it. Let me tell you something. God is raising up Christian warriors, true Christian warriors, true Christian teachers. He's going, this, you know, I see this. He's going, he's not going to the religious elite. He's going to the prostitutes. He's going to the drunkards. He's going to the homosexuals. He's going to the lesbians. He's going to the drug addicts. He's going to the sexually immoral people. And he's redeeming them and raising them up and teaching them through his word. He's teaching them the truth of his word to stand up, to stand on the truth of the word of God and speak the truth of the word of God out. No matter, come what may, come what may. Hallelujah. Oh, praise his name. Praise his name. Amen. Double amen, triple amen. Can't praise him enough. Can't praise him enough. Can't praise him enough. And if we ever needed true teaching from the word of God, we need it in these perilous and troublesome times we are living in. We're, we are living in turbulent times. Times of turmoil. And we need that true teaching from the word of God. We need that in-depth, it needs to be in-depth teaching. And that is lacking in so many of the churches these days. Everywhere, I see it everywhere. All people, all, all Christians want to do is go to church and have, sit in there and have a 20 minutes, sit in there one hour and have one little 20 minute feel good sermon. That's all they want. But didn't Timothy want to? Paul warned us of this in Timothy. Itching ears. Itching ears. And if a preacher stopped behind the pulpit preaching and the Holy Spirit is leading, you, leading him in, in what he's preaching, how could you expect him to stop after one hour? Are you out of your ever-loving minds? You have got to be lost your minds. You have got to be lost your minds. Let me tell you something. Every time that is done, that grieves the Holy Spirit. You are grieving the Holy Spirit. And people make all kinds of excuses. Well, I have to be out of church, you know, at this certain time. I have to be someplace this certain time. Oh, I can't sit in here all that time. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You have got to be kidding me. After all that Jesus Christ has done for you, you cannot give him what? Two hours? Come on. 
Let me tell you something. If you are like that, there is something drastically wrong with your Christian life. And you better get it straight with Jesus Christ. You better get it straight. Something is drastically wrong with your life. Serious message. Serious. And we don't realize how serious this is. We need to get the word out. We need to get the gospel of Christ out to people. Even in our day-to-day -day living, every day we go about. Ask God to bring someone, some, someone across our path. Um, to give us an opportunity to share Jesus with someone. I've said it before and I'm going to say it again. Jesus is coming soon. Jesus is coming soon. Let me go into point six. Jacob poured oil on top of the standing stone. Jacob poured oil on top of the standing stone. The New International Commentary in the book, The Beginning of Wisdom, treat Jacob's action as an anointing and translate the word on the top, uh, um, he poured oil on the top. They translate the word top as head. He poured oil on the top of the head. A more literal interpretation of Genesis 28, 18 would be, He poured oil upon its head. That would be a more literal translation. A Jewish scholar by the name of Sachs says, and I'm quoting, he says, Jacob's deed anticipates the need for priests and kings who will later be the gate of heaven for the people. Jacob's deed anticipates the need for priests and kings who will later be the gate of heaven for the people. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Keep in mind, keep in mind, keep in mind that both words, Messiah and Christ, mean the anointed one. Keep that in mind. This is a precious picture of the life of Christ. It's a precious picture of the life of Christ. Precious picture. I want to take you to one last scripture. And then we're going to close. And it's a wonderful scripture. It's found in Luke 24, 27. Luke 24, 27. And it's when Jesus, it's, it's um, when the two were walking on the Emmaus Road, on the road to Emmaus. And Jesus comes up alongside them and starts walking with them. And they didn't know who he was. Until later on, he sat, he sat down with them. And in Luke 24 and 27, it says, Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Wow! And then their eyes were open, and they knew. He interpreted for them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Their eyes were opened, and they knew. This is the Jesus show. God took his word like a father, taking his wallet out of his pocket and saying, I would just love for you to see some pictures of my son. Starting in Genesis chapter 3, crushing the head of the serpent, through Exodus and the tabernacle, through the psalmist and the king, through the gospels and the glorious revelation. This is the picture book. This is the picture book. Don't miss the portrait of Bethel. 
don't miss the portrait of that love. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. You know, when I when I think when we think when we think of Christ, all that Christ has done for us, our minds just cannot comprehend it. It won't. Our minds are too um, limited. But we believe by faith. And we need to believe by faith without doubting, as James said. I am so thankful and humbled. I am so thankful and humbled for what Christ has done for me. How he delivered me, he redeemed me, and then he delivered and set me free from the pit I was sinking in. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Oh, bless his name. Bless his name. Bless his name. Don't miss the portrait of Bethel. Don't miss the portrait of Bethel. You can see a picture of Jesus Christ right there in that passage over and over and over and over again. Well, here, here, here we are with Jacob again. And we'll be with him in the next lesson as well. I cannot believe it is the weekend again. They come and go so fast. So let's take the time. I see you, Lana. Thank you. So let's take the time to do what we can for Christ while we are here on this earth. It is only what we do for Christ that is going to count when we see him face to face at the judgment seat of Christ. Only what we do for him is going to count. That's it. Nothing else. Nothing else. I pray that God would protect you this weekend. That he would keep you safe. That he would watch over you. That he would keep his edge of protection around you. That he would barricade your mind with scripture all weekend. That he would fill you with his Holy Spirit to overflowing so that you will constantly walk in the Spirit and constantly believe and trust in him by faith without doubting in the sweet and mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Hallelujah and amen. Glory to God. Praise you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Have a good weekend, and God bless you. Keep safe this weekend. Keep safe this weekend. In the mighty name of Jesus, hallelujah and amen. I will meet you on Monday right here at the same place at 8 o'clock p.m for another fascinating study in the Word of God. Glory to God. Praise His name.